Good evening. My name is Lori Zabata and I'm a proud JWU alumna and the Director of Alumni Relations at Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for joining us for today's session titled Sip with JWU, Pinot Noir, Coastal versus Inland. We're excited to bring this program to you virtually and look forward to this walkthrough of the history, styles, tasting, and pairing notes of this lighter, summer perfect red wine, Pinot Noir. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. With the exception of the presenters, all participants have been muted. Please leave your cameras turned off until the tasting portion of the presentation. When directed, if you'd like to turn your camera on, please do so. If you'd like to ask a question, please do so in the chat feature. We will refer to this section to take questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Set your view to speaker view in the top right corner of your screen. This will be the best way to see our presenter. During the presentation portion, we suggest selecting show small active speaker video as the view, which is the middle option on the top left of the menu items. Since we can't be together in person for this program, please keep it social. Feel free to share pictures of your at-home setup, a selfie, or photo of who you're enjoying this session with. Be sure to tag at JWU alumni in your posts on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'd like to thank the alumni relations team for their help behind the scenes of today's session, especially Lauren Anderson, manager of alumni relations for her work to bring this program to us. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Patrick Sullivan, class of 1994. Patrick began his career in the hospitality industry at the age of 15, back in his home state of New Jersey. He wore many hats, dishwasher, cook, bartender, and server. This is where his passion for the industry grew. Hotel restaurant management was clearly where he wanted to be. He enrolled at Johnson & Wales University in Providence, graduating with his BS in hospitality management in 94. Patrick then decided to expand his resume by working at hotel companies like Omni, Marriott, and Starwood. There, he dove into restaurant management, catering sales, and convention services. To broaden his experiences, Patrick jumped on an opportunity to work in the private club sector. His years at the exclusive Ocean Reef Club in Key Largo turned his eyes toward wine. He began studying and tasting wine as much as possible. In 2001, Patrick moved to Denver, Colorado, where after a few more years with Starwood, he was hired by the Republic National Distributing Company. He was a downtown sales representative for five years before he was plucked out of distribution by Jackson Family Wines. He began as a district manager for Colorado. Later, he was promoted to his current position, regional manager for Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. He holds a first sommelier level with the Guild of Master Psalms. Patrick lives in downtown Denver with his wife, Christy, JWU class of 96, and their son, Brayden. We're so grateful to have him and his passion for wine with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming I think I was just welcomed. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm really, really excited to be here today to talk about one of my great passions of wine. And also, I'm really grateful and honored to be with fellow alumni from Johnson & Wales. Uh, I'm very, like Lori said, a very proud graduate, 1994. And uh, crossing my fingers, I have a 12-year-old who really wants to be a chef. So maybe there's some legacy involved here at some point. So. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everybody um, so we can get the presentation started. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, like Lori said, we're going to be talking about Pinot Noir today. Uh, one of my all-time favorite varietals uh, when it comes to wine. Um, and we can't talk about Pinot Noir without talking about a little bit of history. Uh, it was first thought to be planted and made in the first century, but that really hasn't been proven. Um, they, uh, the winemaking has been made for centuries. Uh, a lot of people believe it started in Asia. If you fast forward to 1375, it's actually the first time uh, the term and the name Pinot Noir was seen anywhere. Um, and then in 1880, 
uh, was when the first planting of Pinot Noir was made in, in California. And uh, it's actually an estate that's still around today uh, called Inglenook. Uh, and they are credited with the, the first plantings of this grape in California. Um, and then it, it, it grew from there. The mid 1800s, it made its way to New Zealand uh, in the Otago region, which is still a very, very important region for Pinot Noir today. And in the, uh, 1945, there's an estate, Martin Ray, uh, who's still around today as well. Uh, they are credited with uh, making the very first 100% Pinot Noir wine uh, ever in this country. Um, and you might say, why is that important? Because before Martin Ray came around and even today, uh, there's a lot of blending with Pinot Noir of other grapes. Uh, and I can kind of get into that later. And then by the 1960s, it uh, made its way to the very, very important region of Oregon, which is a, uh, an area that's really on fire today for Pinot Noir for those fan, fans of this grape. Moving on to acreage, uh, I'm not going to do a ton of these data slides. Uh, I'm going to bore the heck out of everybody, but I think it's important. For the longest time, the old world really ruled the acreage in the world. Uh, you know, Champagne, obviously, Pinot Noir is a big part of Champagne, Germany, uh, and areas of France. However, America and the New World has taken over by huge strides because the lots in France especially are, they're divided up as they get passed down generation to generation. And there's really no other place to plant new Pinot Noir in France. There's just no land left to go. So the New World took over and um, is really kind of leading the charge uh, on this varietal. So now we'll get into a little bit of farming, which I work for a family company and our owners say we're at, at the heart, we are farmers. And when it comes to Pinot Noir, um, it's, it's a very finicky grape. Uh, it's very thin skinned, which means it's very susceptible to disease, to mold, uh, everything in its environment. And it is a, what they call shy bearing uh, break, which means the yields are not big when it comes to uh, production and farming. It definitely can morph and change and adapt itself to whatever environment it's growing in, which sometimes is not a good thing. If you're growing Pinot Noir in a very warm climate, sometimes you can get a very astringent wine and it just doesn't come out the way the way it should and you, you don't get the fruit and, and the uh, flavor profiles that you need to get. Um, so the the farming practices are very very important and and site selection is even more important with Pinot Noir. So now we're talking about winemaking itself and a lot of this is dependent on a winemaker's preference. What flavors are they going to go for uh, in the end product? And that's really all of these styles are dependent on what the winemaker wants to do and what the end result it is. Um, from sorting, which uh, in the old world, they always did whole cluster sorting, which means you snip the whole cluster off the vine and you crush the grapes with stems and everything. Um, or you de-stem everything and crush the individual grapes. And it, it lends itself to different flavor profiles um, when, you, when you crush and sort with individual grapes or whole clusters. Uh, fermentation is another huge aspect. Um, when we're talking about maceration, that's a fancy word there in the second bullet point. Maceration is the process of how long the skin stay in contact with your juice, which uh, affects your color, affects your flavor, affects your aroma. It really affects everything. Um, and then, of course, oak aging. 
that happens at, at the end. Uh, again, as the wine sits in oak barrels, whether it be American or French, uh, that gives a lot of different flavor to the, uh, to the wine as well. So Pinot Noir is a very distinct grape and has its own stylistic markers. And these are very general uh, terms uh, that you can look for when you're shopping for a Pinot Noir. If you're looking at um, uh, a jumping point for getting into red wine, if you are a white wine drinker and you want to expand your palate and you want to get into red wine, Pinot Noir is a great, great jumping point. If you go from white wine to a very powerful Cabernet, it may turn you off to red wines. So I really, I highly recommend to those of you out there that are thinking about getting into red, start with, start with Pinot Noir. And the aromas, the acidity, the body, and the texture, uh, these are all general terms that you'll get on, on the palate and in the nose. Uh, of Pinot Noir. Obviously this changes if you're having an Oregon Pinot or if you're having a California Pinot and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, this is a great and helpful slide as well. Uh, not only does it talk about the different uh, fruits and spices and, and things that you get on Pinot Noir typically, but I think this really speaks to food pairing. You know, a great guideline to use with food pairing is either you want your food and your wine to be spot on match in flavors or the complete opposite. <laughs> and what I mean by that is if you're having a butter poached lobster and you pair it with a nice California buttery Chardonnay, that's a great, great pairing. They complement each other. On the other side, uh, say if you're having spicy Thai food, what you don't want to do, and it's all subjective, everybody drinks what they, what they want to drink, uh, but what, what you don't want to do is drink a high acid wine with spicy food, like a Sauvignon Blanc, because it just accentuates the spice and, and, and heats, heats things up a little bit more. So with spicy food, you should uh, go a touch toward the sweeter side, like a, a nice Riesling or something like that. Um, they uh, they complement each other really, really well. Now on this uh, stylistic chart, this goes back to that fancy word I was talking about maceration, uh, skin contact on the juice when it's being fermented. <laughs> and the longer you have the skin in contact with the juice, the deeper color that you're going to get. And what everybody needs to know is no matter if you pick a green grape or a red grape, the juice is always white on the inside. So how to get those colors and the different structure in your wine is through that skin contact. Obviously at the extreme left is rosé and that's very, very minimal skin contact. And then all the way to the right is long skin contact uh, with deeper, darker Pinot Noirs. Uh, so it's a, it's a great little visual aid there for uh, what you're looking for. Um, depending on what you're, you're drinking, um, Pinot Noir, uh, it really does fit into all these categories, uh, you know, depending on where you uh, got your Pinot Noir from. <laughs> uh, regional expressions, uh, again, I touched on this a little bit with the stylistic uh, slide that I had. And these are very, very helpful, especially if you're you know, thinking about your menu that you're having for dinner and you go out and shopping for wine. But I would add a few things to, to these descriptors. In Oregon, not only are they fresh and firm, and firmness is in terms of the tannins and the tannin structure. Um, I would also add earth to that. Oregon always has a really nice, most of the time subtle earthy tone to, uh, to their wines. <coughs> Excuse me. And now in California, you have Anderson Valley, firm and earthy as well. But Anderson also has this really nice spice factor to it, like baking spice too. 
to that to that area. Sonoma Coast and Russian River, <coughs> uh, round and forward, and forward meaning they're fruit forward. Uh, the fruit is the is the star uh, on those wines. Uh, Monterey, earthy and juicy, and I would also say bright. Uh, Monterey has a touch uh, more acid component to it, and it really brightens up the the palate. And Santa Barbara, same same thing, uh, has a brightness to it, but that savory aspect comes from the maritime influence. Uh, it almost almost has a touch of brine to it. So uh, really quick about the momentum of Pinot Noir. Um, 1980 was the beginning, basically. Uh, this country was uh, very late to the party. Um, and really was still not being planted as much as other uh, countries of the world. Uh, we were still going after the big grapes like Cabernet and, and uh, things like that. I don't know where that line came from there. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I'm sure a lot of you on this call saw the movie Sideways. And believe it or not, it not only was it a cultural phenomenon, but it was a viticultural phenomenon. Uh, if you recall, Pinot Noir was a big part of that movie. And, you know, of course, there's that line, I'm not drinking bleeping Merlot. Uh, so it actually got to the point where uh, winemakers were pulling up their Merlot vines to plant more Pinot Noir to, to meet up with the demand. So that's how big that movie was and how big of an effect it had. Uh, and then now the coastline, which we're going to get into uh, on the Pacific, is a really, really booming uh, area for Pinot Noir and very, very popular. So why, why do we go to the coast? Uh, well, it's, uh, like I said, Pinot Noir adapts itself to the environment that it's in, and it really, really loves cool climates and fog and a little bit of wind and you know, a little bit of moisture in the air, and it, it really, really thrives. Uh, the way Pinot Noir grows in these tight, tight clusters, uh, in fact, Pinot Noir literally means uh, pine black, uh, because of the tight clusters that look like pine cones. Uh, and that's where the name came from. So because of those tight clusters, um, they feed off each other and they feed off of the environment that they're in. And it's, again, the, the site selection for your, uh, for your grapes is really, really important. Okay. So we're going to get into some, some maps, and uh, I'm a visual learner, as I know a lot of people are. I love maps. Uh, but also, at this point, if you haven't opened your wine, why don't you go ahead and do that? Um, I have a feeling most of you have already, and that's fine. I'm not judging, because I did a while ago. Um, so this is uh, getting into California. This is Sonoma, uh, situated there in, in Northern California. And on this slide, uh, this is more of a topographical map of Sonoma County. And you'll notice back to my point about the coastline, uh, that all of these single vineyards, and please keep in mind, there are a lot more single vineyards in Sonoma County than this shows. These are just some really key ones. But you'll notice that a lot of them are clustered toward the coast you know, for the reasons that I spoke about, uh, to get that maritime influence and to get the, you know, the acid levels and the characteristics that they want on their, on their grapes. And then we move south to Monterey. God, that line is really bothering me. I'm sorry. I don't know where it came from. Uh, <laughs> Uh, down to Monterey, 
And Monterey is actually considered to be what they call the salad bowl of the United States because of this area is where a lot of our produce, especially like lettuce, comes from. But this you can see in the kind of grayish area of the uh, Monterey Valley here is it's it acts as like a funnel for the winds and the and the weather that comes in from Monterey Bay up there in the upper left hand corner. And it's really a great, great place to uh, grow Pinot Noir and actually Chardonnay for that matter as well. And um, a kind of a neat geological tidbit is uh, out in the bay is something called the Blue Canyon. And the Blue Canyon is uh, actually deeper and wider than the Grand Canyon. It sits uh, underneath the water and when the cold, deep water comes, up, comes from the canyon and blends with a little bit warmer water on the surface, that's where we get our weather patterns from in this area and the fog banks that come in and ebb and flow in the vineyards and really, really uh, nurture our, our grapes here. Okay, so hopefully everybody's sitting on some wine and uh, we can kind of get into the Sonoma versus Mai um, discussion. And the fog versus wind. So on the left is the Sonoma side, and on the right is the Mai side. And in the middle there, you can see those are some very general flavor profiles that you'll get in each, in each one. So on the left side with Sonoma is fog that we, that we talked about. And these fog banks come in in the morning and they really just kind of sit on the vineyards and create moisture levels and acid levels in the grapes. And then in mid afternoon, that all gets burned off in the sun. As the sun goes down, fog will come in again a little bit. And like I said, just kind of ebb and flow uh, in and out of the vineyards and, and really helps, helps the growing process. Um, Sonoma has a lot of redwoods around. Um, there is, you know, millions of years ago, Sonoma basically was the ocean floor. So there's a lot of uh, diatomaceous soil, uh, which is basically fossilized plankton and seashells and, and things like that. Um, and then on the Monterey side, I already started talking about that. They get a good amount of wind, like I said, in that funnel in the Monterey Valley, um, which it's a little bit difficult at times because a lot of wind actually hinders photosynthesis on, on the vines. If they are flowering and the flowers get a lot of wind, uh, they protect themselves and they close up. So it actually extends our growing season in Monterey and extends our hang time uh, at the, the clusters that hang on the vine. And, you know, it's a little bit slower, a little bit slower process there. <clears throat> so extreme coast versus inland. Um, this is Sonoma Coast on the left and then Russian River on the right. And here's how you think about these different areas <laughs> is because Russian River is actually a part of Sonoma. It's a sub-AVA, American Viticultural Area of Sonoma. So think about a target. And you have a wine that just has California designate on the label. Then you have one that's Sonoma. And then you have one that's Russian River. So the outer ring is like a California designate wine. And you come in and you have a, a, a single uh, Appalachian wine, Sonoma, and then you have a single, uh, single vineyard, excuse me, you have a, a single county, and then you have a single Appalachian in Russian River. And then you go in even tighter into the center, the bullseye, if you will, to single vineyards. Uh, and all it is basically is more focus, more focus, more focus, and uh, usually a lot less production when you get down to those single vineyards, because essentially they're just one vineyard for, for that wine. So you're not going to get the same yields 
that you would get from a California designate wine, which can come from Mendocino, can come from Sonoma, can you know, it's as long as it's within California, California, you can have that on your label. <coughs> um, I'm gonna take a sip of wine. So Sonoma, we talked about already, uh, really craggy coastline, really uh, uh, remote and, and really tough, rugged uh, geology in a lot of areas. And uh, typically you want to have a higher elevated vineyard on benchlands, hillsides, mountaintops, uh, so that way they can be in and out of the fog line as, as that weather comes in. And then on the Russian River side, the biggest influence there is the river itself, which Russian River was named after years and years and years ago, Russian uh, fur trappers that made their way down through Canada into California to this area and uh, settled this area. And uh, that's where the name Russian River came from. But the river itself every year actually swells and flows into any vineyards that are on its banks, which is not necessarily a bad thing because the very, very rich silt at the bottom of the river comes up and deposits itself into the vineyard and, uh, and really kind of nurtures the vines. So this is uh, getting toward the end here. Um, and then we can get into some tasting and questions. Uh, but this is a great point of reference for everybody here. If you're out shopping at your local wine shop, liquor store, and you're, you really have a flavor profile in mind in terms of Pinot Noir, or you have a dinner in mind, you're cooking at home, and you're, you're cooking steak or chicken or what have you, this is a great guideline, very, very basic and easy for you to go by with, with, your, with your shopping, uh, with the aromas and flavors and the structure from each you know, major area, uh, Oregon, and then uh, four areas in California. Okay. And now, I think it's okay for everybody to turn their cameras on if you're so inclined and we can get into some tasting. Okay. So, um, obviously we're doing Sonoma versus Monterey. I, I like to do Sonoma first because Monterey has a little bit more acid to it. Um, Sonoma is more fruit forward. And I, the reason why that is, is if you have a, if you have a higher acid wine first, you're always going to have that acid on your palate. So I like to, I like to do higher acid wines um, last. So when you're, when you're looking at your, your wine um, and swirling your wine, um, Obviously, you're looking at the, the color, the very pale color. And to be honest, uh, Pinot Noir should be translucent. It should not be opaque, like a true Pinot Noir. Uh, you should be able to see through it. Um, if you look straight down in your glass at the stem, you should be able to see the stem. If it's really, really dark and you can't see it, chances are it's not 100% Pinot Noir and there is probably other grapes in there. Now swirling, and be very careful because you can swirl it right out of the glass. I've done that many times. Uh, swirling basically aerates the wine. You're bringing oxygen and helping it to open up and, and, and get the aromas out and the flavors, flavors out. And then really probably the biggest, biggest, most important part of tasting is, is smelling. You get your nose in, way in the glass, and you get more, uh, from, as far as the tasting component of wine, you get more from smelling the wine than anything else. Uh, and you can already, on the Sonoma, I, you know, you absolutely, 
of course, I have my wine, you have yours. Uh, hopefully they are Sonoma and Monterey. Uh, but you do get the hints of chocolate and the kind of darker, darker berries, a little bit of blackberry on there. Um, and even a touch of uh, cranberry tartness uh, that you can, you can get on the nose. And there's no wrong answer. So, you know, when we get to Q&A, and you want to talk about the flavor profiles of things, there really is no wrong answer. It's, it's, it's very, very subjective. Everybody's palate and nose is different. I mean, you can't say, oh, this smells like hot dog water because that's ridiculous. But, uh, it's, <laughs> but it's, all, it's all very, very subjective. So don't be afraid to come out and say, oh, I get, I get this, I get this. Uh, it took me a long time to come up with my own descriptors and my own adjectives when it comes to wine. I had to hear other people say, oh, I get cherry, I get cranberry and blackberry and that kind of thing. And I'd be like, oh yeah, I get that too. Um, so that's, that's the Sonoma. And then I'm gonna switch to Monterey. Hopefully I'm not boring the hell out of everybody. Not at all, but um, I'd love to just um, interrupt for one quick second while we, before we move on from Sonoma, can, can you just talk a little bit about what kinds of food you would pair um, with a Sonoma wine versus a Monterey? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the first thing is um, Pinot Noir in general is a very, very grape. It goes with a lot of foods across the board. Um, with, with the fruit component and a bit, a bit deeper tannins, um, I actually have had Sonoma Pinot Noir with steak and it works totally fine. Um, I'm sorry, was there another question? No, okay. Um, and it, it, goes, it goes totally fine. And then as you know, since I just poured, here we'll, we'll click over to Monterey. Since I just poured Monterey, and the, see, if you have Monterey in your class, you can tell it's a very, very different um, nose on the, and that tea leaf is spot on. You get a little bit more of an herbaceous quality with Monterey. And so Monterey Pinot, to Lori's question, I've had this with a real, an, an herbed like chicken dish that works really, really well. Uh, you can do, you can't go crazy with the herbs because you don't want that to overpower your wine, but I, you know, uh, a little bit of, little bit of rosemary uh, on some chicken goes really, really great with, with this wine. Uh, but again, you know, we're looking at the color, very, very pale uh, and see-through. We're, we're aerating it to let it open up. And you can do a little experiment, pour, pour the wine and let it sit for a few seconds and don't swirl it, but smell it and then swirl it and smell it. And you'll see a huge difference in, in, in the notes. And then you can do that with any wine, not just Pinot Noir. Um, so yeah, on the palate, you get just a little bit brighter uh, like I said, a touch more acid. I know I've said that a lot. Um, and basic, basic palate notes for yourself. Tannins dry your mouth out. Acids make your mouth water. Okay. So if you want to go back to the Sonoma and then go back to the Monterey, you'll notice that you're salivating more with the Monterey than you are with the Sonoma. And that's, that's where the acid comes in. Okay. Do we want to field some questions? Yeah, I'll be the one to take the questions from the chat box. So if you have any questions for Patrick, um, whether it's about what you're tasting now or another Pinot Noir that you are a fan of, um, feel free to ask the questions in the chat function. Our first question from Lori, why is Pinot Noir pricey? 
Great question. And I get this a lot, especially in, in my sales role. Um, Pinot Noir is pricey. Again, it goes back to the beginning of my presentation that it's, it's a very, very finicky grape and very thin skin grape that's, uh, that's susceptible to all kinds of mold and disease and, and things like that. The other th side of it is when you're farming Pinot Noir, as with a lot of grapes, um, a lot of winemakers, uh, they do this kind of sacrificial cluster. So as they're going down the rows of vines, they're, they will literally clip whole clusters off and just let them drop and rot and you know kind of go back to the earth. And the reason for that is, is when you think about it, the grapes are the vine's children. And if the energy of the vine is split off and spread too thin into too many areas and too many clusters, you're not going to get the, the vigor that you need, the, the, you know, the flavors that you want. So you cut off some clusters so that the energy of the vine is um, more concentrated. And so that's another part. You know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an expensive venture. You know, every winemaker and estate owner I've ever spoken to has said, you don't get into wine to make money. You have to have money first. So um, Pinot Noir is definitely up there as, you know, one of the more expensive ones to make. And it really, it depends on where it's from as well. If you're, if you're drinking a Premier Cru Burgundy that is, you know, elite, and very, very small lot. Like I said, they get passed down generation to generation and often get parceled off and reduced even more. Uh, so you're talking very, very focused and low, low yields there. Great, thank you. Russ would like to know what affects whether the tannins are strong or soft? Uh, so that is definitely a great question. That's definitely the, the weather. Um, and, and the uh, winemaking process. So uh, if you're fermenting in, you know, with, with skins and you, the longer you keep the skins on the juice, uh, the more tannic structure you're, you're gonna have. And also it goes back to the uh, that whole cluster um, crushing that I was talking about earlier. If you use the whole cluster, you're getting the stems, you're getting everything. And that adds to the tannins as well. So it really, it depends on, on the method. That's uh, really where the tannic structure comes from. Great. Amanda would like to know, what is your favorite cheese and meat pairing for Pinot Noir? Oh, great question. I'm a cheese lover. I haven't met a cheese I didn't like. Uh, but I love uh, Gruyere, uh, a nice Swiss Gruyere with Pinot Noir. Um, it's, you know, if you get one that's like about six months aged, um, it's not quite as pungent then. Um, if you go a lot longer than that, you're going to get, you know, more of those ammonia flavors that may overpower the wine and things like that. So look for something that's kind of young aged, but Gruyere is, is fantastic. And even, it sounds boring, but even a mild to medium cheddar works really, really well with Pinot Noir. Uh, you don't want to go with like a very, very sharp cheddar because again, it, it, it will probably overpower the wine and just won't complement each other. And then what was the other part of the question? Meat? Meat, yep. Um, yeah, I think that goes back to uh, Lori's question of, uh, you know, I, I've had the Sonoma with a steak. I've had the Monterey with an herb chicken. Uh, and like I said, Pinot Noir in general is a very, very versatile wine. Um, and I, I, yeah, those, those are the two examples that come to mind as far as protein is concerned. Um, so I believe you might have touched on this a little bit, but Nancy would like to know, how does one learn how to identify the notes? She smells familiar scents, but how do you learn to break them down and identify them? It's a tasting. Tasting is the absolute best teacher. Um, go out, you know, obviously you don't have to spend thousands of dollars at your wine shop or liquor store and just grab 
uh, whatever you're tasting, different Chardonnays, Pinot Noirs, Cabernets, whatever, and just grab things from different areas. And like I said, it took, when I first started in this business, it took other people to tell me, you know, tell me what they were getting. And I would identify like, oh yeah, I do get vanilla on that Chardonnay. I do get uh, dark cherry on this Pinot Noir. And then after a while, as you taste more on your own and go to festivals, go to, you know, when they can happen again, go to festivals, go to food, you know, food and wine shows and things like that. And, and just kind of have a plan and pace yourself and, and go around those rooms and those festivals and just, and taste that it is absolutely the best teacher. And then you'll eventually come up with your own adjectives and your own descriptors. And like I said, there's no wrong answer. There really is no wrong adjective to use. Because, you know, you, some of our winemakers are the funniest because they come out with some of the really the greatest adjectives and descriptors you can think of, like pencil shavings, uh, saddle, you know, uh, used saddle, you know, leather, and things like that. So you, come, you can definitely come up with your own. Uh, Dion would like to know, should we be overly concerned with the vintage here? Um, Pinot Noir ages pretty well, but it's not like Cabernet or the, the bigger, more robust grapes. Um, and I, 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 you should, and you know, the best thing to do when it comes to vintage is you know, look at the bottle in, in good light. And if it starts turning more brown than the, you know, the red it's supposed to be, um, there, chances are that either it's past its prime or it was, wasn't stored properly. Uh, maybe it, w it got hot and it kind of cooked a little bit. Um, but, you know, if you're at a shop and you're looking at the color, uh, that's, that's a good, uh, signal uh, as to whether it's good or not, but you definitely should be in tune to vintages. Um, you know, uh, the, the Pinot Noir that I'm having right now, the Sonoma one is a 2018, and this will be good 10, 12 years from now. After that, it's probably going to start kind of declining a little bit, losing its fruit component and uh, losing its luster a little bit. Great, good to know. Um, Karen would like to know, um, she, or she said, I just enjoyed a good Vin Gris. I do not see this very frequently. Why is it not more popular or available? It was, it was, what was the name of it? Vin Gris, V-I-N-G-R-I-S. Oh, Vin Gris, Vin Gris. Um, so like, uh, I think it means like a Pinot Gris or something like that? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio, they're kind of, you know, uh, Pinot Gris is like an offshoot of Pinot Grigio. And um, very, very popular right now, actually. And I think in this country anyway, if we've found on the marketing side that if you put a fancy name on the wine, like Vin Gris, people don't know what that is. And they kind of like, all right, I'm just going to move on to the next thing. And that's, you know, that's just how trends work with, uh, with, uh, with wine. For a long time, there's a, a very, very famous estate and winemaker, Robert Mondavi, who I'm sure everybody's heard of. <coughs> Excuse me. And he came up with the uh, term Fumé Blanc, which is basically Sauvignon Blanc with a, just a little bit of oak on it. And he did, they did pretty well with Fumé Blanc, but people just didn't, you know, they would look at a shelf and say, I don't know what Fumé Blanc is. I'm going to have this Sauvignon Blanc as well, not realizing they were getting the same thing. So it's, it's really a matter of perception. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Um, so Evan would like to know, so Monterey wines will have a more herb and woodsy complexity that you don't see in the Sonoma? Yeah, typically, typically, yeah, yeah. And, and, and honestly, some of it has to do with the oak treatment as well. But typically, yeah, it's going to be have a touch more earth to it. 
and a little bit uh, more herbaceous quality to it. Um, you know, I even get on the one I'm drinking anyway, <coughs> I even get like a little bit of basil uh, on mine and, uh, and other kind of cooking herbs. Uh, but the oak treatment definitely comes into play as well there. Um, Charity would like to know, what is your favorite Pinot Noir, low in price and high? Okay, I had a feeling this question would come up. And obviously I'm very biased toward my family. I love my Jackson family. And I'm drinking La Crema right now, which is one of my all-time favorites. Um, uh, but as far as kind of toward the lower end, I think uh, Murphy Good out of California, Pinot Noir, great value, is fantastic. Uh, also, there's another one called Carmel Road out of Monterey that is really, really good. And again, a great, great value. Both of those you'll find on the shelf in, you know, generally speaking, um, around under $15. So, you know, they could be good like house Pinot Noirs for you if, if, you, if you're looking for a house wine. And um, at the top end, I'm a huge fan of Oregon Pinot. And uh, there is a, and I don't think it's super, super expensive. It's, it's a little bit at the higher end, but there's one called Grand Moraine. It's two words, G-R-A-N-M-O-R-A-I-N-E. And uh, they're just, they're doing amazing, amazing things with Pinot Noir out, out there in, uh, in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Great, thank you. All right. Um, Mary would like to know, can you tell us why Pinot Noir likes a little wind and does the wind somehow improve the health of the vines or the grapes themselves? I'm sorry, Lauren, you cut out there for a second. Can you? <laughs> All right. And if anyone's experiencing audio issues, we apologize. Zoom is um, having some technical difficulties, but um, can you tell us why Pinot Noir likes a little wind? Mm -hmm. And does the wind somehow improve the health of the vines or the grapes themselves? It, it does in, in, in some ways because of what the wind brings in when I talk about the, the fog, uh, the fog banks that come in. Uh, and it does bring a you know a little bit of moisture, especially on those coastlines. You're going to get you know moisture from the bays and the oceans, uh, and uh, the wind. As I was saying before, the the vines like wind to a point. After a while, if it gets really windy, the flowers close up, and it pretty much shuts down photosynthesis. And you know the kind of winemakers have to wait for everything to pass but you know they do acclimate themselves pinot noir uh, vines acclimate themselves to a little bit of wind and cooler areas on the coast and again uh with those fog banks that the wind brings in it really uh helps with the acid levels that you want to get in in the grapes now you can get too much, obviously. You can get too much moisture, uh, which results in mold, which is a, like a huge, huge bad thing for, for grapes. So it's, a, you know, you're at the mercy of Mother Nature, and it's a, a very, it's, a, it's kind of a tightrope you're walking, because yeah, it could go either way. Um, but uh, wind, for sure, is very, very important. Great. Um, Daniela would like to ask, can you please give us a refresher about the legs? Slow means more alcohol, correct? No, not necessarily. So, um, well, let me talk about alcohol really quick, too. Because, you know, when you put your nose in the wine and you feel like a little bit of burn on your nose, that's the alcohol. And if you feel a lot of burn, that means that the, the wine is higher in alcohol. And if it's, if, not, if it's a subtle burn, then it's lower in alcohol. Um, Really, the um, the legs. I've always been told, and I've always learned that it's more about the body of the wine. So Pinot Noir, you know, you're going to have legs that, in general, run down the glass fairly quickly, comparatively to other to other wines. And uh, it does have a little bit to do with the sugar content, 
Um, the slower, the slower the legs on the glass, you're probably going to have a little bit more sugar content in in the uh, in the wine, and that means that the body of the wine is a little bit heavier. It's got a little bit more viscosity to it. Uh, but you know, I'm sure everybody's kind of swirling their their wine right now, and if you notice, the legs run down pretty pretty quickly. Uh, so that means it's a it's a little. I hate to use the word thin, but it's a, it's a it's a it's a thin bodied wine. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. Love all the questions. These are great. Yeah, we're having a vibrant chat over here. Um, Good. Valerie wanted um, to ask about sharing the slide of the aroma wheel, and Valerie, we did talk about sharing that in our follow up email, so you will receive that, and also the expression grid um, that you can print off and keep with you when you're going to the wine store, um, just if you're interested in different styles and um, pairing notes and whatnot. So that is something that we will provide in the follow-up. Um, and Barbara would like to know, do you like the cherry pie, the blend of the regions? Oh, okay. cherry pie, the wine? Yeah, yep. Uh, you know, it's been a long time since I've had it. Uh, the, you know, the problem is in, in uh, in our business, when you work for one company, you kind of have this tunnel vision and you like only taste our wines and that kind of thing. I do, I try to branch out and, and try different things as much as I can. I haven't had it in a long time. It's, that's a solid wine. It's, uh, hopefully they haven't changed things. And uh, I, I want to say it's been probably five years since I've, I've tasted it. Uh, but I, I do, I enjoy that wine. I enjoy it. Great. We do have time for a couple more questions if anyone would like to add them in the chat. All right. Dion said, do you think the recent fires in Napa Valley will have an effect on the vine soil, mainly the ash? It's, um, unfortunately, the, there's the thing about the fires this year, usually in California, these happen in October. And by the time the fires come in, harvest has already happened, which means that the grapes are off the vines and they're in the wineries themselves and protected. This year, the fires are early. And it's really, it's not so much the soil um, because the soil will reinvigorate itself and, and, and get back to where it needs to be. And to be honest, <coughs> excuse me, vines really don't, thrive well in really rich soils. Uh, you want vines to struggle in really dry soils where they have to reach down really far to, for any kind of moisture or anything like that. And it creates the vigor in the wine and it creates the certain characteristics. And you want them to struggle. You want your vines to struggle. So the soil is not really so much a factor. It's the smoke. So the smoke and ash. So if the grapes are still on the vine and there's a lot of smoke around them and ash around them, that might be a problem. It still remains to be seen here this year because the skin of grapes are very porous. And uh, this happened back in 2008 as well in Sonoma. And um, there were a couple bottles that I opened that people decided to make their wine anyway. And as soon as you opened it, it smelled like a campfire. And it's just a, a turnoff right away. So that smoke, the, it's smoke taint is what they call it. Uh, so the smoke taints the, the, the skins and the juice, and it's just not the wine you wanna put out, which obviously that is really, really expensive. If you can't put out your product, it's, yeah, it's, We'll, we'll see what happens this year. We will. Um, so a few questions that are similar, so I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase them both. Um, okay. But Russ was asking about um, a little bit more into about becoming a sommelier. Mm -hmm. And Bill said something similar about what kind of advice would you give for someone who is passionate about wine like yourself and would love to get more involved in this field? OK. Um, so. Before I got into this as, as a profession, it was really a hobby of mine. And um, I 
taste it on my own. This goes back to somebody else's question about, you know, how do I come up with my own adjectives and descriptors and things like that? It's tasting, tasting, tasting. So uh, taste as much as you can. I can certainly recommend some great books if you really want to geek out uh, on wine. Uh, and I can always email that to you, Lauren, and you can, we can put it in your, in your follow-up email if you want. Um, and it's, and once you, once you get to a certain point that you're comfortable, there's a lot of organizations out there, uh, that would love passionate people like, like yourself, like the Guild of Master Psalms is one for sure. And they have, you know, uh, uh, different levels of certification and all the way up to Master Psalm, <coughs> excuse me. And um, that's, t start with tasting, read as much as you can, and, and then, you know, you can kind of enroll in uh, these uh, tasting organizations and, and, and get certified. Great. So we have time for one more question, Patrick, and this question is from Marty. How do you think the new Petaluma Gap AVA and Sonoma Coast AVAs compare to the Willamette region? Wow, that's a cool question. All right, so I'm really excited about the Petaluma Gap AVA. Um, and our family makes a couple of wines from the Petaluma Gap. So what, what you have to know is like in super basic terms in how an AVA, an American viticultural area, gets certified as an AVA. Among a thousand other things, the one of the main, main things that you, that has to happen is you have to have some kind of natural phenomenon that sets your AVA apart from every other AVA. So in the case of Petaluma Wind Gap, there's a, a notch in the mountain range, right? Uh, the Maya Camus Mountains right there at the, at, the, at the Petaluma. And what happens is wind comes through that notch and swirls around that's the Petaluma Gap swirls around that area and creates its own little microclimate. And that's how basically the Petaluma Gap got certified as, as an AVA. And I got excited about the first part of the question and I forgot about the second part of the question. What's, what was the second part? That's okay. And compare the Petaluma Gap and Sonoma Coast AVAs to Willamette Region. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, Petaluma is, uh, obviously, you have that natural phenomenon that I just uh, described. It's not quite as coastal. It does get a little bit of coastal influence, but if you do the true Sonoma Coast, <coughs> there are some vineyards where you can literally see the ocean and see waves crashing. Uh, so there's a little bit more of a maritime influence there. In Oregon, Oregon is a really interesting and, and beautiful area. You have the... Uh, the two mountain ranges that actually sit on either side of the Willamette Valley. And um, a lot of people think of Oregon as a lot of rain, you know, because it's, you know, part of the Pacific Northwest, but they don't, they don't get a ton of uh, as much rain as people think because of the coastal mountain range that's right there on, on the, uh, on the West coast of the Willamette Valley. And, um, there's also a, a big influence as far as a large, large mushroom bed that, is, uh, that grows throughout Willamette Valley that contributes to the earthy tones that you get in Oregon Pinots. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, so we have some more questions, Patrick. Um, we will send them to you to answer and we will follow up with people. Um, after the session, just since we're short on time and we want to be aware, but um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for leading us on tonight's tasting experience with Pinot Noir. It was such an informative and interesting discussion about the distinct differences between the growing regions of Sonoma and Monterey. We're grateful that you shared your time with us this evening and really appreciate your insight on this wine variety. Your passion for this topic is so appreciated. We'd also like to thank all of our alumni attendees for joining us tonight. 
Whether you graduated 20 years ago or two years ago, you'll always be important members of the JWU family. Next week, we begin a fall semester unlike any in our school's history. Although our campus environments will look much different, the drive, determination, and work ethic of our students are as strong as they've ever been. In the College of Hospitality Management, our students will continue to gain portable skills that can be applied to any sector of the hospitality industry. I'm sure our presenter can attest this important aspect of a JWU education, and it becomes critical during times like these. If you're in a position to give back today, please consider a gift directly to the College of Hospitality Management. Your gift will provide flexibility to the college throughout the year, and you'll help prepare the next generation of hospitality leaders. We've shared the link in the chat window, and I thank you in advance for your generosity. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed this evening's session, Pinot Noir, Coastal versus Inland, part of the JWU for You family of programming. Through JWU for You, alumni can engage in informative and interesting discussions related to professional development, social, and avid interest topics. Next month, we'll be learning about the classic spirit, bourbon. Oh, my script. What happened? <laughs> With Professor Linda Patin. Mark your calendars for Wednesday, September 30th for the full listing of upcoming events. Please visit our events calendar at alumni.jwu.edu. We appreciate your attendance and wish you a wonderful night. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Patrick. Miss you. Thank you. Thanks Bye. so much. It was Thank a pleasure. You. Thank, Thank you. you. That was awesome. Thank you. Good. Oh, the next one is perfect.